Hello everyone, this is Ben, and in this video we're going to be talking about skepticism, or probably a video series on skepticism, and in our introduction to apologetic series, it is important that we cover skepticism first, because we need to be able to essentially know that we know things, I guess I couldn't think of a right way to say that, but we need to have some sort of justified knowledge. And skepticism is the idea, it goes back to an old Greek philosophical school, so let's look it up. And we're going to type the skeptics. Right? And they, let's see, oh no, I looked up a band. Let's see. Alright. Both in ancient Greece and in India. Uh, we're not exactly sure how far it goes back, but they've got uh, Greek philosophers dating all the way back to 570 BC. We can just basically say like 550, you know, somewhere in there. So it was an actual school of thought or a philosophical movement within ancient Greece. It says India as well. And the basic idea behind skepticism is, well, how do you know that? You don't really know that. No one really knows anything. And that was the idea of the skeptics. They doubted all knowledge. The history books are a little bit, or the historical records are a little bit cloudy. We're not 100% sure. Um, but for our purposes today, the reason this is relevant is as we do Christian apologetics, what you run into oftentimes are teenagers who are just like I was at their age. I discover skepticism as like a philosophical concept, and I begin to really ask, like, how does anyone really know anything? You know, um, and I've had teenagers do that. It, it tends to be a thing, more so a thing with... Uh, the teenage boys seem to be the ones who embrace what I like to call basic skepticism. Uh, but I think in, in philosophy it's just called skepticism without any extra adjectives to modify it. Um, which just means you just doubt all knowledge. Nobody knows anything. I doubt everything. Um, the uh, But there's other forms of skepticism. It appears that in ancient Greece... Historians are not real sure if anyone actually was a basic skeptic. Uh, if they were, they moved very quickly to academic skepticism, which is a different form. It's very similar, and we'll talk about that later in the video and what that is. But what's oftentimes more relevant today is what's called local skepticism. And there's a bunch of different kinds of local skepticism. So. There's global skepticism, and there's this basic form, and there's academic global skepticism, which just means you just basically you doubt everything. Okay? So global. And then local skepticism uh, just means you doubt certain things. So something that's very common, I hear more with teenage girls than anything else, is they, they're, they're what's called ethical skepticism, where they doubt that we know anything about right and wrong and morality. Um... So we're just going to go right down through this whole deal because if someone really uh, subscribes to skepticism, it essentially means that everything we do in Christian apologetics is refuted by this more basic fundamental doubting of all knowledge. You know, So we need to address this. You may say, well, Ben, who really doubts all knowledge? Well... It's one of those things that you can't really do in life, you know. Uh, it's kind of hard to live your life and doubt all knowledge, you know. Like when you walk across the street, do you really have serious doubts about whether or not you should make sure the bus isn't coming? You know, oh, if the bus is coming, I might get run over. And then you say, well, maybe I should doubt that the bus is coming, you know. <laughs> um, it's hard to live life that way. Uh, what I run into a lot is... Uh, this is real common, actually. Young people who realize that philosophical questions are a thing, 
and they thought about it for maybe like 30 minutes or something, and they came to some conclusion, and they had some brilliant insights. A lot of times you have like kids who are actually really gifted, but they're not uh, rigorous, and uh, they're, they're, there's an intellectual laziness, and so you have like gifted but lazy, and so they, they, they figure out something pretty smart, like basic skeptical questions are important questions that we need to address. Like, how do we really know anything? But they don't go any further. They're not careful. They're not, they don't put in the time. They don't put in the effort to really agonize over these ideas. They just figure out something that's actually, they have some sort of smart insight, and then that's it. And you have a lot of young people in churches or anywhere, teenagers who are gifted, but intellectually uh, they want to move too fast. They don't want to take their time and move slowly. And they become cocky. And they, I mean, I've seen it more than once where there was a teenager that, like, um, you know, I've had this more than once where they, they believe all the Christian stuff, but in the back of their mind, they're thinking that skeptical stuff that they talk about with their friends, and they just don't say that to grown-ups and adults. And so they come to the Bible studies, they pray, you know, and they're thinking all that skeptical stuff in the back of their minds. That's what they, like, so when I was in high school, you know, I didn't say all the skeptical stuff to my parents. I didn't say it to the pastor at my church or my teachers, but I talked about it with my friends, and with my friends, like, yeah, we all, we all subscribe to it on one level or another. Um, for me personally, the, as a teenager, the, the issue was like, you know, how do I know God's real? And I decided, wait a minute, how does anyone know anything is true? And I said, no one does know anything. There's no way to really prove anything beyond the shadow of a doubt. So therefore, I can believe in God. And if anyone says, well, you, how do you know God's real? I would say, well, nobody knows anything, so I can believe what I want. You know, and uh, that was how it worked for me. And there's a little, you know, bit of a, of a smart insight there, but it's severely lacking in other ways. And uh, again, intellectual laziness. The best philosophy is done slowly. And the issue with philosophy is, you know, one way to think of what philosophy means, like, yes, the word is Greek for the love of wisdom. That's what it translates to in English. But... One way to think of it is philosophy is the discipline of study where you you take a look at things and you study things and you seriously question and rigorously, you know, journal articles back and forth on, on questions that are simply just assumed in other fields. So, like, for example, in science, you don't ask questions about whether or not anybody knows anything or like in science there's a bunch of things that are just assumed true like mathematical truths um, or like for example does the external world exist can we trust our observations of the external world just generally I'm sure they're wrong some of the time but in general are they trustworthy are they reliable in science you just assume that you know or like in medicine that would be relevant and important too you know, so, or for example, in history, there, or with detective work, there's this question of like, well, did we, did we, pe did the whole universe and, and us and everything pop into existence five minutes ago with memories in our brains and food in our bellies and uh, everything has the appearance of age and uh, really nothing happened more than five minutes ago because that would severely affect how we do history, that would severely affect you know, how detectives do their work. You know, you can't really find somebody guilty of a crime that didn't happen. And all of our memories of those crimes and all the evidence of the crimes would all be faked by this, you know, random chance event. So, like, these are skeptical f questions that in philosophy you deal with. But in other fields, you just assume, like, historians and detectives just assume the past is real. You know, doctors and nurses just assume that the external world is real. You know, just like scientists just assume that. They don't have a way to prove that in their toolbox. In philosophy, you do. Now, you say, well, Ben, why are you bringing this up? 
Well, the issue is, is a lot of times you have people in who don't study philosophy. They study something else or they're into something else, but they realize that philosophy is a thing and they realize that these basic assumptions are there in those other fields and they realize that like in those other fields nobody bothers to prove them and then they think oh there's no way to prove anything about any of this stuff you know so they kind of draw this conclusion a lot of times it's young people that think like oh you know in science you know they don't really have a way of proving this they just kind of assume this and that means that nobody has a way of proving this, you know, because no one ever talks about this. And they don't realize that philosophy exists. And the thing is, philosophy underlies every other discipline, and they don't get taught it in school. They don't know it's a thing. Um, so, so anyway, um, that's why we're going to talk about this, because you know, what argument for God's existence am I going to be able to provide you? Or what evidence am I going to be able to provide you for the resurrection or anything like that? Or about the historical Jesus at all? If you don't think that anyone can really know anything at all. You know, so that hopefully gives us a little bit of an intro. What I want to do now is go over to a Bible passage. Uh, Proverbs 7 and 8 makes a case for being wise. And it being a smart and, and, and gaining knowledge, you know, and being, you know, if you're wise and knowledgeable, then I think it's safe to call you smart. You know, sometimes people get offended by that idea that I would say that the Bible tells us to be smart. But we're going to see in these passages that it tells us to be wise and it tells us to be to, to gain as much knowledge as we can. Then that sounds like a smart person to me, you know. But what Proverbs 7 and 8 does is it describes two women. And it starts out with a woman that seems like a real woman. And she's a woman who sleeps around. And she, you know, is a prostitute. Or, you know, it, it, she's described as an adulterous woman. And it warns us about how this woman entices you. But actually she brings more problems on your life than you think. But... The next chapter, you move into chapter 8, and it starts talking about wisdom. And wisdom this, is this other woman, a good woman, the woman you want in your life. Um, you, you need to love this woman, you know. And so, the uh, it uses the metaphor of these two women. And then in chapter 9, it reveals to us that the other woman, the adulterous woman, the prostitute, who seems enticing, who, who draws you in, is actually foolishness. So these women are meta metaphors, although the advice that he gives about avoiding a prostitute or an adulterous woman is obviously good advice. But the Proverbs is saying something more and something beyond that. So anyway, what I'm going to do is read some of this. Um, because I think it helps us uh, lay a kind of a groundwork for what we're going to talk about and, and helps reinforce the point that of why we need to talk about these things. And so it says, My son, keep my words. And store up my commands within you. Keep my commands and you will live. Guard my teachings as the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers. Write them down on your heart. Say to wisdom, you are my sister. And to insight, insight is when you figure out something that's hard to figure out. You are my relative. They will keep you from the adulterous woman, from the wayward woman with her seductive words. So it's 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 foolish to, you know, spend time with the adulterous woman, but also the adulterous woman is foolishness. And so it's a, it's a there's a metaphor here where wisdom and insight will keep you from foolishness. All right, at the window of my house, I looked down through the lattice. I saw among the simple, I noticed among the young men, a youth who had no sense. He was going down the street near her corner walking along in the direction of her house. At twilight, as the day was fading, as the dark of night set in, you don't want to be walking towards her house then. Then out came a woman to meet him, dressed like a prostitute with crafty intent. She is unruly and defiant. Her feet never stay at home. Now in the street, now in the squares. At every corner she lurks. 
she took hold of him and kissed him, and with a brazen face she said, Today I have fulfilled my vows, and have food from my fellowship offering at home. So I came out to meet you, and have looked for you, and have found you. I have covered my bed with colored linens from Egypt. See, she's enticing. Foolishness is enticing. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh and aloes and cinnamon. See, the thing is, there are ways to make things that are irrational seem smart. And, and logic, these are called fallacies, where it's, you know, like, you seem like you, something proves a point, but it actually falls short of it, but it has the appearance of doing so. And, uh, come, let us drink, de let's drink deeply of love till morning. Let's enjoy ourselves with love. My husband is not at home. He has gone on a long journey. He took his purse filled with money and will not be home till full moon. With per persuasive words, she led him astray. She seduced him with her smooth talk. All at once he followed her, like an ox going to the slaughter, like a deer stepping into a noose. Trap. He's walking in the trap. Till an arrow pierces his liver, like a bird darting into a snare, little knowing it will cost him his life. Now then, my sons, listen to me. Pay attention to what I say. Do not let your heart turn to her ways or stray into her paths. Many are the victims she has brought down. Her slain are a mighty throng. Her house is a highway to the grave, leading down to the chambers of death. Now we move to chapter 8. Does not wisdom call out? Does not understanding raise her voice? At the highest point along the way, where the paths meet, she takes her stand. Beside the gate leading into the city, at the entrance she cries aloud. To you, O people, I call out. I raise my voice to all mankind. You who are simple, gain prudence. You who are foolish, set your hearts on it. Listen, for I have trustworthy things to say. I open my lips to speak what is right. My mouth speaks what is true. For my lips detest wickedness. All the words of my mouth are just. None of them are crooked or perverse. To the discerning, all, all of them are right. They are upright to those who have found knowledge. Choose my instruction instead of silver. Knowledge rather than choice gold. For wisdom is more precious than rubies, and nothing you desire can compare with her. I, wisdom, dwell together with prudence. I possess knowledge and discretion. To fear the Lord is to hate evil. I hate pride and arrogance, evil behavior and perverse speech. Counsel and sound judgment are mine. I have insight. I have power. By me kings reign, and rulers decrees, and rulers issue decrees that are just. By me princes govern, and nobles, all who rule the earth. I love those who love me, and those who seek me find me. With me are riches and honor, enduring wealth and prosperity. My fruit is better than gold. What I yield surpasses choice silver. I walk in the way of righteousness along the paths of justice, bestowing a rich inheritance on those who love me and making their treasuries full. This is wisdom he's talking about. The Lord brought me forth as the first of his works. Before his deeds of old, I was formed long ages ago. At the very beginning, when the world came to be, when there were no watery depths, I was given birth. When there were no springs overflowing with water, before the mountains were settled in place, before the hills I was given birth. He, before he, before he made the world or its fields, any of the dust of the, or any of the dust of the earth, I was there where he set the heavens in place. When he marked out the horizon on the face of the deep, when he established the throne, the clouds above, and fixed securely the fountains of the deep, when he gave the sea its boundary, so the waters could not overstep his command. When he marked out the foundations of the earth. Then I was constantly at his side. I was filled with delight day after day, rejoicing in his presence, rejoicing in the whole world, and delighting in mankind. Now then my children listen to me. This is wisdom talking. Blessed are those who keep my ways. Listen to my instruction and be wise. Do not disregard it. Blessed are those who listen to me, watching daily at my doors, waiting at my doorway. For those who find me find life and receive favor from the Lord. But those who fail to find me harm themselves. All who hate me, hate wisdom, love 
って。